Amen. God is at work all over the globe, and God is at work here among us this morning. Uh, my name is Derek. I have the privilege of being the pastor here at First Baptist Tillman's Corner, and I have the great privilege of spending some time together in God's Word with you. Uh, if you will find your Bibles and open them to Jonah chapter 1, we are walking through a series in the book of Jonah called When God Says Go. And in connection with that series, we are asking all of you, and, and this is something that I want to set the example. It's from the pastor down. We are putting a blank check on the table. What does that mean? Uh, this is our life. And we say to the Lord, Lord, we will go anywhere you want us to go. We will do anything you want us to do. We'll say anything you want us to say to anybody you want us to say it to. It is the Lord's job to call, to lead, to direct. It is our job to be obedient. You know, so many times in our lives, we try to figure out God's part, right? Lord, uh, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to be? God, uh, I need to know uh, your calling on my life. I need to know this. I need to know that. Hey, you can relax. That's God's job. He'll let you know. Uh, our job is to say yes and to do it, right? So we're praying over the next couple of weeks, uh, and even beyond that, we're praying that God would clearly speak to us as we say, God, here is the blank check. Here is my life. There's nothing in the memo line. Uh, you just let me know where you want me to go and what you want me to do. And the answer is already yes. I just need to know what it is that you'll ask me to do. Uh, we are using the story of Jonah, who he's kind of exactly the opposite, right? God says, I want you to go. And he says, no. Uh, I want you to notice, by the way, that Jonah ends up in Nineveh anyway, but we'll get to that in coming weeks. But uh, God calls Jonah to a very difficult task, uh, perhaps a more difficult task than any of us will ever be called to, and Jonah goes the opposite way. That's what we're going to see today. But before we get there, I want to ask you just a simple question. Have you ever played hide-and-go-seek with like a, a toddler? So old enough to walk, old enough to kind of, you know, have some, some wits about them, but maybe under, say, five years old. You ever play hide-and-go-seek? with? It's the easiest thing you'll ever do, uh, by the way, is play hide-and-go-seek with a toddler. Uh, they think if they can't see you, then you can't see them. So they'll just hide, and, you know, they'll... Uh, so, so one of our kids, I have five of them, I won't say which one, but one of them used to hide by sticking his or her, uh, just want to be, just want to be as vague as I possibly can, his or her head under a pillow on the couch, and that's all they would cover up, just pillow over the head. And, and you know, you'd walk around saying, well, where is such and such? I wonder where such and such is. Just this past week, uh, I had one of, uh, Marshall, our youngest, was hiding from me, and he was hiding in the bathroom, and he had just taken a towel and put it over himself, and he was just laying there, and, and there's just this big clump of a towel, you know, and I wonder where Marshall might be, you know. It's interesting to play. Now, as they get older, they get a little better, and sometimes you have to say, son, you actually can't crawl into the drainage ditch and hide, okay? That's all, as out of bounds, you can't hide there. Uh, but when they're younger, it's a lot of fun because you always know where they are. You always know. It's really a futile thing that a toddler does when they play hide-and-go-seek with an adult. We, we kind of know some things that they don't know, and it's always obvious to us where they hide. Do you know it is the same way? It looks just as futile when we try to hide from God. Do you know the first person to ever try to hide from God was actually the first person? Adam. The first person to ever try to hide from God. Genesis chapter 3, Adam sins, and he goes and he hides himself behind a tree in the Garden of Eden. Now, who made the Garden of Eden? Who made the tree he was hiding behind? Who made Adam? God. God's first question, first recorded question in the Bible. Where are you? Do you think God asked that question because he didn't know where Adam was? A person, a being he had made, hiding behind a tree he had made in a garden he had made. Adam, where are you? No, that's like me walking around the house saying, I wonder where Marshall is. I wonder, seeing all the time he's right there. I wonder where he is. No, it, it wasn't for God's benefit. He didn't need Adam to say, I'm over here, God. It wasn't for Adam's benefit that he asked that question, for God's benefit that he asked that question. It was for Adam's benefit that he asked that question. Adam, where are you? You really ought to take a look around. Are you really trying to hide from me? Some of you here today are running from God, hiding from God, but I want you to know, and we'll see today in today's passage, you can't escape the presence of the Lord. You can't get away from it. 
It doesn't matter where you go, there he is. Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, only one verse today. The Bible says this in chapter 1, verse 3 of Jonah. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, would you today, those who are running from you, those who are hiding from you, God, would you help them to see they cannot hide from the presence of the Lord. And Lord, would you call them to the deepest part of who they are to simply turn around. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can't escape the presence of the Lord. I'd like for us to just think about three characteristics uh, of trying because just because you can't, and, and by the way, we all know, whether you're in this room watching online, sitting in overflow, wherever you are up the balcony, maybe you, maybe you come in and you say, well, I'm going to sit as far away from the pastor as I can uh, back in the comfy seats in the back. I'm not calling anybody out, but maybe you chose to sit back there because it's comfortable, but maybe you said, I just want to get away from the stage, you know, so the pastor maybe won't, won't uh, preach to me. But the thing about it is, you're not trying to get away from me, you're trying to get away from the presence of the Lord. And you can. You can get away from a pastor, right? You can say, hey, I don't want to go down to that church. I don't really feel like being there today. The pastor might say something that applies to me, and people in the room might look at me. So I'm going to stay at home, and I'm going to watch online. But guess what? When you are at home watching online, guess who else is there? The Lord is there. You say, well, I'm done with church. I mean, I, I'm done. I tried the online thing, and, and, and you know what? Still, I just felt under conviction, so I'm not even going to go anymore. I, I'm just not going to go to church anymore. I'm going to stay away. Some of you in this room know what that's like because there was a period of your life where that's exactly what you did. You said, I'm just not going down there to church. I had a friend one time that had the privilege of leading to the Lord. Before I, I led him to the Lord, I invited him to church. He said, I can't go to church. I said, why? He said, well, the last time I went, uh, the light above me that I sat right under flickered, and that was God's sign that he was going to kill me the next time I went to church. I said, you're misreading God's sign. You need to come to church. But some have just said, if, as long as I don't go to church, I had a friend that I witnessed to in high school, never saw him come to know the Lord. He has come to know the Lord now. But I would invite him to come. Every time I was preaching, I would say, come and come, you know, come. And I, I, it's not that I cared that he heard me preach. I thought that was the excuse I could use to get him to church. So please come. I'll be preaching this Sunday. And he made me a promise one day. Grant, he said, he said, uh, okay. He said, you've asked me enough. He said, I'm coming to church this Sunday. I said, okay, praise God. Well, of course, I looked for him, small country church, so you can't hide there, and he was not there. And he didn't come to church. So I called him as soon as church was over, and I said, hey, you gave me your word. You were coming. He said, I did, and I sat in the parking lot the whole time. I never told you I'd come in the church. I told you I'd come to the church. <laughs> but you can sit in the parking lot, and you can't get away from the presence of God. God's presence is everywhere. And that leads me to the first characteristic. You can try to escape the presence of the Lord if you want to, but it's foolish. It's actually a fool's errand. Now that doesn't keep us from trying, does it? It doesn't keep us from saying, I'm just going to get away from God. I'm going to get away from the people of God, the things of God. But no matter where we go, there he is. Jonah tried to get away from the presence of the Lord. Uh, verse 1 uh, gives the command, verses 1 and 2. And in verse 2, God tells him to arise, get up, arise, go to Nineveh. Verse 3 shows us that he got the first part of the command right, right? But Jonah rose. He rose. That's what God commanded him to do. But he went in the opposite direction. Do you know, when you, when you hear about Nineveh, Nineveh is a city that is east of where Jonah was. We don't know exactly where he was in Israel at the time. We don't know if he was in his hometown. Maybe he was in Jerusalem. Some people do think he was in Jerusalem because of what it says about him fleeing from the presence of the Lord. But either way, he's in Israel, uh, right there on the Mediterranean coast. And, and Nineveh is east of that. So Nineveh is a journey that is east of that. And then Tarshish is west of that. And, and I put a map inside of your listening guide, and there's one up on the screen so you can see. The star is where Jonah was. So Jonah was somewhere in that area. You see where Nineveh is, and to get to Nineveh, he would have to travel along what we call the Fertile Crescent. You might remember reading about that in your high school geography classes or history classes or in some Bible classes you've taken. That's the route he would have taken to get to Nineveh. It's about 650 miles by land, so it would be about a 650-mile 
walk. And, and although we would enjoy a cruise much more than we would enjoy walking across land, in the ancient world, traveling by sea was very dangerous. So you only did it if you had to or if you stood to make a lot of money by doing it. And so most people didn't travel by land, especially Jewish people. They were not seafaring people. It's not something they were super comfortable with doing. So they didn't go out, especially into the Mediterranean. Remember, we have something called the Sea of Galilee that those of you who go there, you look at it and you go, well, that's no sea, that's just a lake. We call that a lake in Alabama. Why? Because for them, that was the biggest body of water that they had much interaction with. So they were not, for the most part, seafaring people. But Jonah, instead of walking by land 650 miles to Nineveh, he gets in a boat to take what would be about a 2,500-mile trip by boat. They would hug the coastland, and you can even see it in the story of Jonah later on as the Bible says they were rowing trying to get to shore. They didn't know how to navigate the open seas very well, so most of these vessels just hugged the coastline, and that's the route that they would have taken, 2,500 miles. I also want you to notice about Tarshish. It's about as far west as you can get without going out into the Atlantic Ocean. And so that's about as far as a trading vessel would go in the Mediterranean. That's the turnaround point. That's the, hey guys, we don't get any further than this. It's not easy to navigate out in these waters. And so I want you to know that when the Bible says he rose and God told him uh, to go and he goes west instead of east, he is getting as far away from Nineveh as he possibly can. And it was intentional. Now, Jonah rose to go to Tarshish. Three times the word Tarshish is used in that verse, and that's not just put there to make it hard for you and I to read and pronounce. It's put there to emphasize something. He's going as far away from the presence of God as he can get. But it's not just Nineveh he's running away from. In fact, that's not actually what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish to get away from Nineveh. No, he rose to flee from the presence of the Lord. Very next phrase, he went down. Jonah's trying to get away, not from Nineveh, but from God. Jonah, so otherwise, Jonah could have just stayed at home, right? Jonah could have just stayed right where he was and said, I'm not going to Nineveh. But Jonah said, it's not enough to get away from Nineveh. I need to get away from God. Jonah wanted to get away from God and he wanted to do it by getting away from the promised land, the nation of Israel, the place where God's presence dwelt with his people. He wanted to specifically get away from Jerusalem and the temple. That is where the presence of God, the manifest active work of God. Now, God can and does work anywhere, but under the old covenant, he put his manifest presence right there in that temple and that's where the work of God took place through what the priests did and through the service of the priests. And yes, God worked outside of that temple, but there was something special about that temple mount and God doing his work. So special that today, Jewish people will get special permission from the government to go to the stones that are buried far underneath ground that are closest to where the Holy of Holies were. And when they have a special prayer request, they can apply with the Jewish government and go stand close to those stones. When you see them praying at the Western Wall, they're going there because that's close to where the Holy of Holies used to be. And, and this place, though, is not something you can see from outside. And they go underground and they get as close as they possibly can so they can touch the rocks in hopes that somehow those rocks that were close to the presence of God might get them close to the presence of God and God might hear their prayers for a very special request. This was important to the Jewish people and Jonah said, I've got to get away from that temple. I've got to get away from Jerusalem. I've got to get out of Israel. I need to get away from the presence of the Lord. But that's foolish, isn't it? Jonah went down. Why does the Bible tell us that? Of course he went down to Joppa. Wherever he was in Israel, we don't know, but wherever he was in Israel, he went down because Joppa's on the coast. I have a picture of my wife and I standing on the coast just north of Joppa. Now this is probably about three or four miles north of Joppa. I like to say this is the exact spot 
where uh, the fish deposited Jonah back on the beach. Now, we can't prove that to be true, but you can't prove any other spot. So I like to say this is it. This is where Lindsay and I are standing. But you can see, we are as low as you can get on the ground. The sea is right there. So Jonah went down to this place. Went down. When the Jewish people went to worship, they always went up to Jerusalem. You always go up to the temple. You ascend to the temple. When you're reading your Bibles and you see a psalm of ascent, guess what that is? That is a song that they would sing as they went up to the temple, as they are ascending to the temple. So you always go up to Jerusalem. Here we are at the lowest spot Jonah can possibly get before he gets into a boat. But that's not all that he did. He went down... Yes, to Joppa. But then he went down, chapter 1, verse 3, into the ship. So he went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship. Chapter 1, verse 5 says he went down into the inner part of the ship. Chapter 2, verse 6 says he went down into the depths of the sea and close to death. Some believe maybe he even died. We'll talk about that when we come to chapter 2. But over and over again, in these first two chapters of Jonah, you hear this phrase, he went down. Where, what is that communicating to us? It is communicating to us that he is trying his best, whatever he does, not to go up. Because to go up is to go into the presence of the Lord. Jonah's trying to get away from the presence of God. You should have remembered the words from David. This is written before Jonah's adventure. Psalm chapter 139, verses 7 through 8. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I free, flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. See, David, who loved the presence of God, David loved to go to the tabernacle that would later become the temple. David loved to be right there where the manifest presence of God was. David was the one who brought the tabernacle to, uh, to Jerusalem. And David's the one who brought the ark to Jerusalem. And David loved to be in the presence of God. You might say David loved to go to church. David loved to go to church when the presence of God was there. David loved to be in a good revival. If he heard that the Holy Spirit was moving and working in a church, David wanted to be there. He loved the presence of God. But David also knew the presence of God is not confined to any kind of building. The presence of God is everywhere. And David said, if I go to the highest heights, I go to the lowest points, you are there. So Jonah, trying to get away from the presence of the Lord, was on a foolish errand. You know, I wish it were only Jonah who ran from the presence of God. But just as foolish as it is for a toddler to hide by putting a pillow over his head, just as foolish as it is for Adam to hide behind a tree that God made and a garden God had made, just as foolish as it is for Jonah to think, if I can just get far enough away from Israel, I will get away from the presence of God. It is just as foolish for us to think that there is anywhere or anything we can do, any place we can go to get away from the presence of God. You can't do it. But that does not mean we don't try. In fact, some of you, many of you, will spend most of the best, listen to me, most of the best years of your life running from the presence of the Lord. Now, why would you do that? Why would you give the best years of your life running from the presence of the Lord? How do we do it? We do it in many ways. Some of them are evil. We do it through addiction, through pursuit of money, through immoral sex. You know, my brother's testimony is one of 15 years of addiction. 15 years of addiction that I never thought I would see God break in his life. But for those 15 years, he wasn't just running from problems he had or running from people that loved him. No, he was running from God. So sometimes it's through addiction or other evil things like the pursuit of money, wanting to just have more and more and more. And I, I don't have time to go down to that church. They're just after my money anyway, and I'll have to give 10% if I get to become a really serious Christian, and God may want me to give some money to missions, and I just don't want any of that. I am after money. But there are also neutral ways, 
neutral ways. Things that are neither good nor bad, but we use them. And, and honestly, I, I think there are many people using evil ways to run from God. And don't think that you can't use it, that, an evil thing to run from God. And don't think that if you're stuck in an addiction or you're stuck in some kind of evil pursuit of money or if you're just a downright mean person, that that in some ways is not you running from God. That's definitely you running from God. But, but there's also neutral ways, right? It's just distraction. I think this is how most people run from God. Just distraction. I just want something else other in my life. Take my mind off all my problems. Take my mind off everything that's going on out there. And so we, just, we live in an age of distraction and meaningless endeavors and idleness. How much of our time do we spend doing things that really do not matter? Why? Maybe we're running from the Lord. Maybe if things got quiet enough and we weren't distracted anymore, we'd have to deal with what we know to be true. We have walked away from the presence of the Lord. Then there are other good ways, things that would be otherwise good and fine and beautiful and part of God's creation and things that he's given to us for our good. And, and we can use those in idolatrous ways. Anything good is in danger of becoming a God. And so we take good things and make them God things and we use them to run away from the one true God. And those things would be uh, health. I mean, some people, uh, you've, I've shared with you before, I want to be in good health as long as I can. I want to be the quarterback for my, when we're playing backyard football and my grandkids are out there, I want to be the all-time quarterback. This is my goal in life. And I want them to be afraid to rush the passer because they know if they rush the passer, I'm gone. That's what I want when my grandkids are, are teenagers. I want to be uh, that guy. So health is important. And by health, you can extend your ministry and your reach. And so health is a good thing, but health can become a God thing. You can use it to run away from God. What about career? God's blessed some of you with a great career. God has used it for, for your good and for your family's good. But oh, how quickly career can become a place to pour yourself into and God kind of becomes an afterthought. Now, I still go to church. I'm a good family man. It, it'd be bad for my career if I didn't go to church. So I'm still here and, and I'm there with my wife. But you know, I put my arm in men. This is mostly us. It can be ladies. But I still put my arm around my wife and, I'm, and all things are, are good with me. And I got my kids right there and I'm going to make sure all is good with them. But man, really what I am pursuing, where I find my fulfillment, where I find my joy, where I'm going to make my impact in this world is I'm going to be the best fill in the blank that I can. I'm going to be the greatest whatever the world has ever known. I'm going to find a career and I'm going to milk it for all it's worth. And in doing so, you're running from the very thing that you know God has called you to. Does that mean you're all to leave your careers and become full-time um, uh, pastors or missionaries? Please don't. Our church needs to function. We need your careers, okay? And that's not what that means. But it means that God has given you a family or God has given you a career God has given you health as a part of his call in your life. And if you can't see that, then maybe you're running from the presence of the Lord, running from the call that God has given you in your life. Trying to escape the presence of the Lord in any way, even a good one, is just as foolish as trying to get in a boat and run from him. There are three characteristics of trying to escape the presence of the Lord I want us to think about this morning. The Second one is this, it's dangerous. We all know where this is leading for Jonah, right? This is leading into a storm that is going to cause the people on board finally to throw him overboard. He's going to be swallowed up by a great fish. We know that this is leading to a dangerous situation for Jonah. Running from God or trying to flee the presence of the Lord is also dangerous for you. You know, it's interesting that where the presence of God is, that's actually where your protection is. You want to be safe? You want to be protected? You want to be held and taken care of? Then get in the middle of God's will. That's where the protection is. It's where the provision is. It's where you find purpose for your life. And here's what I'm trying to say. Jonah would have been safer in Nineveh. That place where those horrible, wicked people lived that did all the horrible things we talked about last week, Jonah would have been safer in Nineveh than he was on that boat. 
It's dangerous to try to flee the presence of the Lord. You know, Lindsay and I served as uh, missionaries, church planting missionaries in Miami for seven years. When, um, when we started telling people, hey, God's called us to move to Miami uh, with, with our two young kids and one on the way, uh, do you think everybody said, you know, that is the grandest thing I've ever heard of in my life. I'm so thankful for y'all. That's not the response we got. Some people did that. Other people said, uh, I can't believe you're doing this. I can't believe you're taking your kids down there to that dangerous city. Um, I remember one man we shared at a church, and I don't know the man, don't remember his name, don't remember the church's name. But we shared, and afterwards people were coming up and talking to us and you know, saying, hey, I'm praying for you, and that kind of thing. And this one guy came up to us and he said, hey, what, what you're doing is, is great, but it's horrible. I don't know what to do with that. I don't know what that means. But so many people thought, man, you're carrying their kids to that dangerous city. And hey, listen, Miami, is, it, it can be a dangerous city. Did you know Mobile can be a dangerous city, by the way? I don't know if y'all know that or not. Mobile can be a dangerous city. You say, I live out in the country where it's safe. It can be dangerous out in the country too. It's, you, know where, you know what is dangerous? The world. That's what's dangerous. The broken world we live in is a dangerous place. And it, and it was dangerous in Miami. We had uh, either were broken into our, our, either our cars, our house, or just things stolen from us six times that I know of. Uh, and one of them uh, was, was a pretty big break-in. Uh, a couple of them were pretty big break-ins. And so, yes, we had things stolen from us. I, I remember that uh, just after we moved, I was trying to show Pastor Ralph where we lived. So I searched for, for our area just so I could see it on the map. Well, a news story came up. It was about a week or two after we lived. And the gas station where we always got our gas, same place we always filled up. There was a guy who just pulled in the parking lot. As far as they know, it was just random and just shot somebody uh, uh, think about a dozen times right there in the parking lot of that gas station and just drove off. They think it was just random. Uh, there was a house that we, uh, we were in a park one day and we used to go north, south, east, and west from this park, handing out door hangers, inviting people to church, trying to witness to people and pray for people. And so we, we were in this particular park on this day. We, we were going east, I think. And I looked up and there was a news chopper in the sky. And in Miami, you just don't watch the local news. You don't have time to be that depressed. Uh, so you just don't watch the local news. We, we made it three nights, by the way. When we moved there, we said, we want to get to know the area. And so we're going to watch the local news. Three nights in, we said, we're done. We do not need to know that all this goes on in the city that we live in. Uh, but I saw the news chopper in the air and I thought, that's interesting. So I pulled up the local news uh, site and come to find out there had been a shooting two blocks north of that park. Uh, the, uh, the police had gone to serve a warrant. They knocked on the door. They shot through the, um, the door and shot one of the police. Thankfully, he was not injured. Uh, he was not killed. And, and then the SWAT team had come now and surrounded that house. And now there was a, there was a showdown happening there. Thankfully, no one was killed in that showdown. I followed the story to find out. Uh, how, but here's what I want you to know. We've put so many door hangers on that house. Been there multiple times, that house, and put door hangers. So yeah, it, it was dangerous. I can tell you story after story. But you know what? In the middle of the will of God, with the presence of God, we were as safe there as anywhere we would, could have possibly been. In fact, it would have been more dangerous, dangerous for us to not be in Miami than it would have been for us to be there. God calls you, he'll take care of you. And guess what? He may call you home. It may be that you're the one that loses his or her life in some kind of issue or instance like that, but God knew it before you went there and he's got a purpose for it. So many times people will say, Pastor, we're going on this mission trip. Can you promise me that it'll be safe? Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot promise you that sitting in this room is safe. I can't make that promise to you. Do we do our best to make sure it's safe? We do. We do our best to make sure our trips are safe. But I wouldn't dare say, oh, I promise you, you get on a plane with me and it will be safe. I cannot make that kind of promise, but I can make you this promise. Whatever happens when you're in the will of God is perfectly within his perfect and beautiful plan for your life, your family's life, for everyone around you's life, for this church's life. It is within his plan. Pastor, I can't understand how that works. Neither can I, but it is the safest place to be is right in the middle of God's will. And the most dangerous place to be is trying to get out of the presence of God. It's very dangerous. Where does running from God lead us? God loves you enough to make you miserable when you run from him. 
God loves you enough to take away things you love when you run from him. It is very dangerous to run from God. Do you know, there are some of you here today who maybe the only reason you came was to hear that. God loves you. You, you may think this. God must hate me because all he's putting me through right now. Nope. God loves you enough to put you through anything and everything, to wake you up, to get your attention, to bring you back to him. God loves you enough to put you through what he's putting you through right now, to open your eyes, to help you see. Now, some of you are following the Lord and you're suffering as you follow the Lord. And that's very different. I would point you back to our Job series. But some of your suffering has been brought upon yourself because you have run from the Lord and God is taking things away from you to get your attention and open your eyes. It's foolish. It is dangerous. But it's not hopeless. Jonah rose to flee from, to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah went a long way away, at least he tried, from the presence of the Lord. Some of you have taken a thousand steps away from God. Again, I share the story of my own brother who for 15 years, everybody tried to tell him, you're going down the wrong path. You're walking away from the Lord. You're not going the way God wants you to go. And for 15 years, 15 years, how far can you walk away from God in 15 years? He did it every single day, every single week. He just stepped further and further away from God. Even in times when he did a little better with his addiction for one reason or another, his heart was still not right. It, it, he would just, and he was still stepping away from God. God for 15 years, a thousand steps, a thousand miles, 10,000 miles away from God. How far was Jonah trying to get? 2,500 miles away from God. He was trying to get away from the presence of God. But here is the thing. If you have walked a thousand steps, a thousand miles away from God, guess where God is? He's right there. So you can try to leave God but God's always right there. Wherever you go, there he is. It, you know, Jesus tells us about this. Jesus actually says, you try and run away from me, I'm going to follow you. Matthew chapter 18. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, what does he, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go into search of the one that went astray? And when he finds it, truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than the 99 that never went astray. You know, when we used to sing that song, I Speak Jesus, we sing that song and we talk about Jesus for my family. That's who would come to mind. I, I've shared about it. Those of you who are new to our church, you, you may not hear this, or may not have heard this before, but those who know, you remember when I would say... I, I sing that song and I think of my brother. I do think of my kids. I think of my wife. But I think of my brother and I think, Jesus, I don't even know what else to say. You ever prayed for somebody so much that you don't even know what to say anymore? You don't even know what to pray anymore? You just say, Jesus. I think that's what's so powerful about that song. I don't even know what to ask you to do, God. I've asked you this. I've asked you that. This has happened. That's happened. I thought this might help and that might help. None of that helped. Now all I know to do is say, Jesus. It's what... It's what the Apostle Paul told us in Romans chapter 8, that when we don't know what to say, the Spirit prays for us. And all I know to say is Jesus. And I would sing that song and I would just say, I just, I just speak the name of Jesus. I don't know what else to say, but I know the only way that something is going to change is Jesus. And for 15 years, 15 years, my brother walked away from God. And there came a day when he was laying in a hospital bed. He said, oh, the Lord had to put him on his back to get his attention. You know how many times he had laid in a hospital bed before? 
you know how many times over 15 years the life he was living had put him in that same place? You say, well, what was different? Jesus. That's all I know to tell you. Jesus is that finally, whatever it took, God got to that deep place of his heart. And you were there. So many of you were there because you prayed with me for my brother. And some of you got an opportunity to meet him. I'm telling you, it was, it was almost two years ago now. And when he turned around in that hospital bed, listen, he didn't have 15 years to walk back to God. It was not a 15-year journey back to God. It was an instant journey back to God. And when he finally gave in, when he finally submitted, when he finally said, God, I'm done with running. I'm tired of running. God, whatever it is, I surrender. I give up. I am not in control anymore. You are God. I am not. You heard the profession of these men earlier, those simple words, Jesus Christ is Lord. That is a powerful confession. And when he finally said, Jesus Christ is is Lord. It was not a 15-year journey back into the presence of God. It was an instant transformation into the presence of God. God was right there waiting for him to turn around. And, on, and I'm telling you, his story is beautiful because every day, every day since that day, almost two years ago, God has blessed him. God has given him back so many of the things that the enemy stole, that sin stole, that his own selfishness and pride stole from him and from his family. God has given him back so much of it. Every day. Not a 15-year journey back. The path of death is a long, slow path. Because we serve a gracious, loving God. And he will fight you down that path. And at every turn, he gets in your way. And you go around him. And every turn, he places something, some kind of roadblock. And you just jump over it. And then there's a tree. And you get out your chainsaw. And you cut it. And you say, I'm God. this is the road I'm going. I am bound and determined to go down this road. And God fights you every step of the way without violating your freedom to reject him. Without doing that, he will in every way put everything possible in your path to stop you. It is a long, slow road down the path of death and destruction because we serve a merciful and gracious God who is trying to stop you from going down that road. But listen, the path of life is short and quick and sweet. When you turn and you head back, life is right there. It is the step. It is one step. You don't even have to get the other foot there. Just take the step and life is there. Some of you are surrounded by death. You're surrounded by destruction. And you're saying, where is God? He is right there and he is just simply waiting for you to turn around. It is, life is right there. Oh man, and then pastor, he's going to put my marriage back together and he's going to give me my job back. And he, No, I don't know about all that. His will, his plan, his time. And what you wish life would be, listen, is less than the life that God wants to give you. See, that's where it comes to the strings attached. So, you go, hey, God, I'll repent. God, I'll, I'll turn around. I'll actually quit my addiction or I'll, 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 quit my, I'll quit my career, whatever it is getting in your way, if you'll do this and this. You do this and this, and God, I'm in. Uh, Lord, you do this and this, and I'm all, I'm all on board. No, it does not work that way. And the path that God has laid out for you is better than any path you could have chosen for yourself. And slowly but surely, God will surround you with life. But you don't have to wait a thousand steps, a thousand miles. No, you just simply have to turn around. You know... God asked Adam a question. Where are you? It was not for God's sake. It was for Adam's sake. Now, there are no hypotheticals in the kingdom of God. Everything works out according to his plan. I know that. But what would have happened if Adam had said, God, I sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm foolishly hiding behind a tree but what I really need to do is just simply repent and ask you for grace and mercy. 
We don't know. But we do know that question was for Adam's benefit. Adam, where are you? You're hiding behind a tree covered up with a leaf. Is this really the life that you want? So that is my question for you. Where are you? For some of you, that's God's question for you. He has asked you that today. Where are you? How long, how long, as he asked Saul, will you kick against the goads, the thing that the farmers use to direct the cattle? How long will you kick against that? How long will you fight against what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to give you life. Where are you? Are you running from God? Are you trying to get away from the presence of the Lord? It is foolish and it is dangerous, but it is not hopeless. Dear friends, today is the day. Will you turn? Will you step back in to the path of life, to the presence of God? Father, I pray for men and women all across this room. I pray for those who are watching online. I pray for those in overflow. Lord, the message is simple today. We can't get away from you, but we try so many times. Lord, would you convict? Would you bring faith? Or would you help those who are here who need to come back to you to do it? Just to, just to come to you. God, you do your work in the hearts and lives of every person in this room. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.